some Bible background before we get into the scriptures, which are going to be really interesting today. At the Pastor's Pint Thursday, I told people I was going to be preaching today about the song, Hallelujah, you know, the Leonard Cohen song. I love that song, said everyone. And I said what I always say, why? Why do you love it? Well, out came the answers. It's haunting. It's uplifting. It hits me deeply. It's a hallelujah to the whole, the entirety of life. I don't know another song that does that, said someone. Someone else said it's open-ended. It's meditative. It takes me on a different journey every time I hear it. But what does it mean, I asked, because I'm a little bit lyrics obsessed. What's all this in the first verse about cutting hair and a kitchen chair and bathing on the roof? Silence. Well, there are two biblical stories you need to know to have a popular understanding of this song. And that's the story of Samson and Delilah in Judges 13 and 16, and the story of David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel. Long stories, we're not going to read them today. I sent them out in the around the church earlier this week. I'm sure you all read them, right? Sure, sure you did. So, so very briefly, Samson was born to parents who were barren, as often happens in those Hebrew scripture stories. And once he was born, his family took a Nazarite vow for him. And that meant that he couldn't drink wine and he couldn't cut his hair. He was dedicated to God through his whole life. He, he would have an unusual connection to God as long as he didn't drink wine or cut his hair. That's the way those vows worked. Don't ask me why. <laughs> and you may know that the legend grew about him. Fun stories, actually kind of violent stories. He was supposedly a man of just enormous strength. And maybe not as much wisdom as he could have used. And, and when he fell in love with Delilah, a, Palest a Philistine woman, he, she tried to get the secrets of his strength. He didn't give it to her, 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 then he did. So what does she do? She cuts his hair. He wakes up, no hair, his connection with God gone, his superhuman strength gone, and the story goes from there. He wound up growing his hair back, his strength returned. That's, that's kind of the end of the story. It's really worth reading. Then there's a story of David, King David, you know, who came to the attention of the palace first, perhaps, by playing the harp, the lyre, to calm King Saul's unruly moods. So he was a musician. He eventually became king. He became a king with great power. The story goes that he was up on the roof. You know, they had rooftop gardens. It was a normal thing to be doing. And he saw a beautiful woman on another roof, a woman named Bathsheba. He sent for her. He had her, as they say. Um, the song makes it sound more romantic than it was. A king with his power calling for her. It's a brutal story in all likelihood. Anyway, she, um, she got pregnant. Her husband was off at war. He tried to bring the husband home to, uh, to take some, shift the blame off of himself for getting her pregnant. And um, one thing led to another, and he finally wound up sending the husband to the front lines to be killed, and he was. It's a horrible story, horrible story. But uh, you need to know that story to understand this song. Still, none of us explains the reference to tying someone on a chair, which has kind of driven me a little crazy about this song for a lot of years. But hang on, we'll eventually get to that. So you need to know the background of those two stories to kind of get the essence of the song. But to get a better, deeper understanding of the song, I think we need to take a deep dive into two other texts. That's Psalm 42 and Mark 15. Psalm 42 is about trust in renewal of your relationship with God. It starts, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise God, my help and my God. It starts out talking about how this, this person who wrote it used to be a leader of the procession going up to Jerusalem and praising God, but for some reason his relationship with God has soured, God has distanced 
he or she has grown distant, whatever. So God is no longer there for this person. But here's the key, the key phrase, hope in God, hope in God, for I shall again praise you. I know that relationship's going to come back, my help and my God. And I think a little bit similarly in Mark 15, when Jesus is dying on the cross, his very last words, he's quoting a psalm, Psalm 22, and saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here is Jesus feeling forsaken and abandoned on the cross, and yet, and yet, he says, my God, my God, I know you're there. I feel forsaken, and I know you're there. He stays in relationship through the worst of the abandonment and pain of his last moments on the cross. Well, I think that's enough talking. I think that's more than enough background to get us started. I'm reading the, the scripture for Mark 15, 33 to 41 from the New Revised Standard Version updated edition. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw this, in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joses, and Salome, who followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. The word of God for the people of God. So I wanted, I wanted to preach about this, address the song before I left. It has become like the secular anthem of our country, perhaps the world. I've been thinking about it a long, long time. We hear it at memorial services, we hear it at weddings, and thanks to Colin, several of us have read about it. He's heard my lament often enough. I love it, but what does it mean? And so for Christmas, he gave me a copy of a book called The Holy and the Broken, which is a whole book about the song and what it means. For one thing, I think we love it because of its haunting tune. And the first verse addresses that, the fourth, the fifth, the minor lift, the, or is it the minor something and the major lift? Um, from a classical radio website in London, I got this, that, that the music itself, what, look at this, I'm already out of order, which is perfect for the song, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Let me get back to the music. I'm going to get back to that. Let me go back to the, the word itself, hallelujah. Have you ever thought about what hallelujah means? It's Hebrew, actually, for hallelujah, or praise Yahweh, which is an ancient term for God. It's used 24 times in the Psalms, another four times in Revelation. Hallelujah. I remember, not long before I came to this church, hearing a Buddhist Christian songwriter explaining that we love to sing the word hallelujah because it contains all the vowel songs, or at least most of them. Ah, e, o, e, ah. And she said, take this for... for you know, I didn't research this, and what do I know? But she said that each vowel song responds to a chakra in the body. So when we sing hallelujah, we not only praise God, but we open up all our chakras. And the ooh sound, she said, corresponds with the heart chakra. That's why the great romantic songs sing of moon and June. It's that ooh sound. 
Take that for what it's worth. But it's a very satisfying word to say and even better to sing. And Leonard Cohen himself, who wrote the song, said that he chose the word hallelujah because it means so much in so many different ways. So when I hear the song, memorial services, weddings, and I hear people swooning, there we go again, swoon, about it, I tend to get in their faces and say, well, why do you love it? What does it mean? I don't know, I just like how it makes me feel. I like where the song takes me. Well, it turns out, reading this book, I discovered that, that Leonard Cohen took years to write it, maybe as much as 10 years. He finished it clear back in 1983, and for all of his work on it, his record company turned him down. He had written 150 different verses. I believe that Alan picked the best six. He pared it down to the four that we usually sing. All the verses are enigmatic. Many of them are sensual. Some of them are devotional. And if you hear different things at different times in this song, it's often because, A, we bring different needs to it when we hear it, right? But more than that, artists pick different verses and they'll arrange them in a different order. And how you do that impacts what the song means. Make sense? Now, everyone that I know of sings the first verse. I heard there was a sacred chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing hallelujah. Well, I'll bet you musicians know what that means, right? Do the rest of us know what it means? No. Not so much. <laughs> but, for one thing, you've got your biblical spidey sense going on right away, right? Because you know that David played the harp and lyre, that David, who later became king of Israel, is said to have written a fair number of the Psalms that are so full of hallelujahs. And then that line, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, turns out to be a description of the chord progression that's taking place under the words, right? Right, say the musicians. I can put the link in the ATC for the detailed description of this from that classical music website. But what it says is that it's Leonard Cohen giving a nod to musicians. But actually, it's not a sacred chord he's talking about. It's a chord progression. The whole song, all the chord progression in the whole song is the secret chord that pleased the Lord. For what that's worth. Now, Jeff Buckley whose version really made the song famous back in the 1990s. He chose the sensual verses and dropped out a spiritual verse or two. And he sang the song as a hymn to sexual passion. And boy, that's definitely there. Alan sang some of those verses. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Her beauty and the moonlight overthrew you. And there's King David again. Got to be, right? And then, that really enigmatic, she tied you to a kitchen chair. She broke your throne. That's David. It sure didn't do his kingship any good, what he did with and after Bathsheba. She cut your hair. That's got to be Samson, right? And from your lips, she drew the hallelujah. Now, does it matter? I think it does. That both Samson and David were undone and disempowered by where they let their sexual passion take them. And does it matter, and I think it very much does, that both returned to their vows, both returned to God, Samson grew his hair back out. David was horrified when he realized what he had done, and he wholeheartedly repented. Nevertheless, the damage was done. Yeah, but what about that kitchen chair? Man, I've looked and looked, I thought, did I miss a kitchen chair in the Samson story? <laughs> There is no kitchen chair in the Samson or David stories and it's been bothering me for a long time. The answer comes in the afterword to the book, The Holy and the Broken. It's on page 251. You have to read a long time before you find out about that kitchen chair. And here it is. Are you ready? So, Laird Cohen confessed that when he was a young child, his mother would insist on cutting his hair. When he got a little older and tried to refuse, she would use one of his father's neckties 
to tie him to a chair in their kitchen, and she would snip away. Then she'd tell him that, like Samson in the Bible, Leonard was completely in her power and would have to do anything she asked of him. My God, the therapy bills he must have had from that. But it's less about sex than it is about power and powerlessness. And despite being bested by your own powerlessness, crying out a hallelujah anyway, I think. So much genius in here, as Cohen wrote about the ambiguity of life. I've seen your flag on the marble arch. Love is not a victory march. It's a cold, and it's a broken hallelujah. And this verse, which doesn't get sung nearly enough, that we got to hear today, you say I took the name in vain, I don't even know the name. But if I did, well really, what's it to you? There's a blaze of light in every word it doesn't matter which you heard, the holy or the broken, hallelujah. Someone at the conference yesterday noted that the heart is a very elastic organ and can hold a myriad of contradictory feelings all at the same time. A hallelujah can come from a heart that's both cold and broken. A hallelujah can come from a soul that is both holy and broken. And I think that's why this song cuts so deep and holds us so close. It's why it worked in the background of the cartoon Shrek, of all places. When Shrek thought he'd lost the love of his life, and it didn't hurt that the year was 2001, and the country needed this emotional acknowledgement of both pain and hope. I think it's why it worked somehow as a peace anthem, of all things to open the Winter Olympics. Remember K.D. Lang singing it in 2010? It's why it worked the Saturday after the 2016 elections. Now, I always cry when I think about this. On Saturday Night Live, do you remember this? Kate McKinnon opened Saturday Night Live with a cold open, dressed with her hair done as, as like a dead ringer for Hillary Clinton. And she sang a version ending in, I did my best, it wasn't much. And even though it all went wrong, I'll stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. Even, even when the verses aren't chosen or arranged just as we need, the song still somehow has the power to give us what we need. Just coincidentally, Yesterday, on the way down to the conference in Salem, I was giving a re-listen to Brandy Carlyle's book, Broken Horses. I think the first time I listened to it, I had a concussion, and I don't remember a lot of it. <laughs> anyway, Brandy Carlyle is the country and Americana roots singer from up in the Seattle area, who sings just about everywhere and with just about everyone these days. Well, she was telling in the book the story about going to her Baptist church to be baptized when she was 16 years old. She'd spent all this time preparing for it. She was good friends with the pastor. She had her whole family coming, despite their suspicion about churches, only to find when she got to the church that morning that the minister, who knew her well and full knew that she was gay, had changed his mind and wouldn't baptize her because of it. She bolted from the church. She never went back. And in her devastation, she found comfort and grace listening night after night after night to Jeff Buckley's sensuous, passionate version of Hallelujah. Through weeks of listening to that every night, she found the grace she needed to move on. As someone said on Thursday, it's a hallelujah to the entirety of life. He said, I don't know another song that does that. Well, maybe not, but there's a psalm that does that. I have prescribed Psalm 42 more than any other psalm to those of you living through bleak times and enduring crises of faith. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people continually say to me, where is your God? 
I remember as I pour out my soul how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts of thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. And then here's the payoff lines. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. I shall again praise God. My help and my God. It contains all that elasticity of the human heart, doesn't it? Remembering how, how the psalmist was once leading the throng and celebrating God, and now God's nowhere near, but I know God will be there again. That's the certainty of the end of it. Psalm 42 has carried me through my own bouts of depression, bad ones, one per church if you're counting. The first, the worst, but the one that cracked me open ultimately in all the good ways. And I wouldn't be a third of the person I am now if it hadn't been for that. And each time, Psalm 42 was confident and prophetic and true. I will again praise you, my help and my God. You know, and then just look at Jesus. There he was dying on the cross. And what's the last thing he says, according to Mark? He quotes Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's feeling abandoned, but he's so confident in God's presence, albeit hidden, that he's able to say, my God, my God, not once but twice. I'm feeling abandoned, but you're my God. Now, all of this might seem really peculiar to preach about on a day with baptisms. Actually, the song was scheduled first, I will say that. <laughs> but, you know, I think it works. Even though a lot of you might be thinking, shouldn't we be a lot more upbeat and happy on a day when we baptize two children? The thing is that baptism does not confer a magic shell of protection. And this family knows as well as any that life offers a balance of weddings and funerals and baptisms, the whole megillah. Elena and Audrey will know that range of life too, unless somehow you find a way to hide them away in a glass cage, and that's no life either, is it? This family knows we all know how goodness and love and life and light arrive in the cracks and in the imperfections and in the sorrows of life, as well as in the more obviously joyful times. And we all know the life-giving incongruity of singing a holy and a broken hallelujah. All of us. So back to Thursday when somebody at Pastor's Pint said, I love the, that the song sings a hallelujah to the entirety of life. I don't know another song that does that. And I think it was Bruce Goya who quietly said, well, there is that song that the pastor wrote after losing his family. And I said, you read my mind. We're singing it this Sunday after the sermon. It's one of my favorites. I've been accused of picking my favorite hymns the last all these years, and actually I haven't been. But I think starting today I'm going to start these last few weeks I'm here. Preacher's prerogative, and this is one of my favorites. My life flows on in endless song. Before we sing it, let's pray. Beloved God, we thank you for the genius of Leonard Cohen and the gift of this song, which enables us to sing hallelujahs from holy and broken hearts in all of life's joys and complications and sorrows. We thank you for the song, which helps us always, which helps us always and again to praise you, our help and our God. Amen. <laughs>